Hi there, and welcome to this video on A-level biology for the AQA specification, focusing on the topic of cells, and in particular, on the methods of studying cells. I'm Manisha from StudyMind, where we help you to revise A-level biology with our helpful video tutorials tailored to your subject, your specification, and to you. If you're new here, please make sure to click that subscribe button. And whilst you're watching, feel free to leave any comments down below of anything you're unsure about, and let us know if it's your first time watching so we can send you our free revision resources. We also have helpful timestamps to guide you through the specification. So, let's get started. Welcome to lesson four of nine in this tutorial, covering the methods of studying cells. This is the fourth video in our series of nine lessons on the topic of cell structure. In the last lesson, we learned about differences in cell structure and function. Here are the key learning objectives for today's lesson. The first is to look at different kinds of microscopes. Next, we will look at magnification and resolution. And finally, we will look at cell fractionation and ultracentrifugation. Here are the AQA specification points for this tutorial. Feel free to pause the video now and have a quick read through them before we begin. First, we will look at the different kinds of microscopes. The field of microscopy studies how to develop and use microscopes to visualise biological processes. There are two main types of microscopes that we'll discuss in this section. These are optical light microscopes and electron microscopes. Let's look at optical microscopy first. First, the light passes through to the specimen then into the condenser lens of the microscope and then into the objective viewing lens. Finally, it goes into the observer's eye where the brain forms an image. The light can also pass to a camera linked to a computer which can display the image on a screen. Now let's look at some limitations. Because optical microscopes use normal white light, the limit of their resolution is around 200 nanometers. In cells, this means that optical microscopes cannot be used to properly study ribosomes, endoplasmic reticulum, and lysosomes. The maximum magnification is 1500. Any magnification above this is useless because of the relatively low resolution of optical microscopes. Electron microscopes use electrons to form images. Because electrons are smaller than photons of light, electron microscopes have a much greater resolution than optical microscopes. The maximum resolution of an electron microscope is 0.002 micrometers. They can be used to produce very detailed images of tiny structures known as electron micrographs. Because the resolution is so good, the useful magnification can be very high, up to 500,000 times. However, elect electron micrographs are black and white. Electrons cannot be seen by the human eye. Hence, they are projected onto a fluorescent screen to form a black and white image. There are two types of electron microscopes, transition electron microscopes and scanning electron microscopes. A TEM will produce very high resolution images. TEM projects an electron beam through a sample and a 2D image will be formed. It can be used to produce very detailed images of cell organelles. For example, 
you can see the stacked grana inside of the chloroplasts. Denser tissue will appear darker in the micrograph as the electrons are more easily absorbed. In less dense regions of the specimen, the electrons can easily pass through, making them appear lighter on an electron micrograph. However, there are some limitations. TEM cannot be performed in normal air and must be performed in a vacuum. Living specimens cannot survive in a vacuum, so TEM cannot be used to visualise living material. Also, TEM can only be used for thin tissues. Thick specimens would easily absorb the electrons and therefore would not produce good images. Now let's look at SEM. SEM is different from TEM in that it projects electrons across a specimen instead of simply passing them through it. The scanning process releases electrons from the specimen which are captured in the cathode ray tube. These captured electrons will create the image of the specimen. SEM can produce 3D images of the specimen. It can scan the surface of the specimen and capture all the textures. Unlike TEM, SEM is used to see thick specimens. Now let's look at some limitations. Compared to TEM, the SEM provides much lower resolutions. However, it still provides higher resolutions than a light microscope. Overall, electron microscopy is a very useful tool in biology compared to optical microscopy. But there are some benefits of light over electron microscopy. Light microscopy can be used to visualise living and non-living specimens. It's also relatively quick. It's also less expensive. A decent electron microscope can cost upwards of a million pounds, whereas an average light microscope is a few hundred pounds. The reagents needed to prepare the specimens for electron microscopy are also much more expensive. Now let's have a look at the comparisons of different microscopy types. First, we'll compare the cost. Light microscopy is relatively cheap, but TEM and SEM are quite expensive. In terms of the speed, light microscopy is very fast, but TEM and SEM are quite slow. Now, let's have a look at the specimens. In light microscopy, they can be alive or dead, and thin or thick. In TEM, they have to be dead and they also have to be thin. Whilst in SEM, they do have to be dead, but they don't have to always be thin. In terms of the image, in light microscopy, we can get a 2D image, which can be in colour. TEM is 2D, but it's either black or white. SEM can only provide us with 3D images, which are black or white. Now let's look at the resolution. The resolution of a light microscope is around 200 nanometers, whilst TEM is 0.2 nanometers. SEM is the best of the lot with 10 nanometers. Now let's look at the magnification. Light microscopy has a magnification of 1,500. Whilst it increases in TEM and in SEM again.
Our next specification point is to look at the size of an object with an optical microscope. Magnification and resolution are two different things. Magnification involves making something bigger, whilst resolution is the ability to tell the difference between two points. In microscopy, magnification is the ability to make an image of a specimen larger than it actually is. Microscopes use specialised glass lenses which alter the light passing through a specimen in order to magnify its image. The image can be viewed by the observer or can be projected onto a screen. To calculate magnification, we need the size of the image and the size of the real object. We can then use this formula. Resolution is simply a numerical measure of how clear and detailed an image is. Resolution is a measure of the microscope's ability to distinguish between two points which are close together on an object. Let's have a go at this question. Pause the video now to have a go at it by yourself before we go through it together. The answer is shown here. Let's go through it step by step. The first thing we have to do is work out the image size. This is 9.4 centimetres. Now we must convert into the correct units. So we would do 9.4 multiplied by 100 to give us 94000. Now we need to rearrange the formula to give us magnification is equal to the image size divided by the actual size. Next, we can put the numbers into our equation. Now let's attempt another question. Feel free to attempt this on your own before we go through it together. Here's the answer. First, we have to work out the image size. This is 29 millimetres. Next, we need to convert into the correct units. So here, we would multiply by 1000 to give us an answer of 29000. Now, we need to rearrange the formula. Here, we need to know the actual size, so we do the image size divided by the magnification. Next, we can put the numbers in. Here's another exam question. The answer is shown here. First, we need to work out the image length of the blue line. This works out to be 20 millimetres. Next, we need to convert into the correct units. Now, we need to rearrange the formula. Our next step is to put the numbers in to work out the magnification. However, our question doesn't end there. We now need to work out the length of the image of the nerve cell. Now we must convert into the correct units and rearrange the formula. Next, we can put the numbers in. This will give us the actual length of the nerve cell. Now let's cover the principles of separating cell components. 
Cell fractionation is what we use to separate. Separate out different organelles from each other. It requires a step-by-step -step experimental process. Let's go through them together. First, we break the cell to release the organelles. Next, we filter to get the organelles only. The next step is to centrifuge the organelles and separate them by size. There are three steps in summary. First, there is homogenization, which breaks up the plasma membranes of cells, releasing all the organelles into solution. After release, they can be separated from each other. Now, the plasma membrane has been broken. We can vibrate the cells at very high frequencies, or we can blend and grind the cells. A scientific way of grinding up cells is by using a special instrument called a Downs homogenizer. A cold temperature must be used. When the cells are burst, protease enzymes are also released into the solution, which might digest the organelles. The solution is ice cold to reduce the enzymatic activity of these proteases. pH of the solution is maintained by an isotonic buffer. Drastic changes in pH can harm the structure of the organelles. A cell lysate is produced containing the homogenized cells. This lysate needs to be filtered. A gauze is used to filter the solution Remove the non-homogenized cell, cell debris, and tissue debris. We only want the organelles. The gauze will filter based on size. The pores of the filter are designed so they are all a certain size. This size is large enough to allow small organelles to pass through, but large enough to prevent unwanted debris from passing through. Centrifugation is our next step, which will spin the sample at a particular speed. Different objects with different sizes are separated in the sample based on their weight. Heavier objects will settle at the bottom of the tube, while lighter objects settle at the top of the tube. Ultracentrifugation separates the organelles from each other. It is a type of centrifugation that uses extremely high speeds to separate very small objects that have a tiny size difference relative to each other. There are two rounds of centrifugation. The lysate solution is put into tube A first. Then tube A is simply centrifuged. The heaviest organelles, such as the nuclei, will settle at the bottom. The remaining organelles will remain in the solution. This is put into tube B and then ultracentrifuged. Again, a pellet is formed in tube B. The speed of the ultracentrifuge is specific to the organelle. The process is repeated until all the organelles are separated from each other. The organelles left at the end will be the heaviest. Once separated, the organelles can be used by researchers for many different types of experiments, such as electron microscopy, to study their structure. Our final specification point is to look at the importance of artefacts and organelles. An artefact is damage caused by a preparation technique during microscopy. On the image, they may appear similar to the organelles. We've now covered all the specification points for this lesson. Feel free to skip back through the video and re-watch any of the sections you feel unsure about. If you enjoyed this tutorial, make sure to subscribe by clicking down below and leaving a comment of the topic that you'd like to see a video on. Click here to watch the rest of our videos in our A-Level Biology series, or visit our website, studymind.co.uk, for past paper compilations by topic and specification.